We're excited to have with us next Uri Gorin, who's head of recommendation at Argmax. Uri is an experienced NLP and recommendation practitioner, having worked for several Fortune 100 companies and startup as a machine learning researcher. Uri founded rmox.ml, a recommender system services firm that develops and deploys end-to-end -end recommendation system. He's here to discuss contextual bandits, a technique that combines both aspects and bakes machine and deep learning into the process. Contextual bandits are increasingly adopted in the industry and are being used by recommendation giants such as Netflix, Facebook, Expedia, and many more. Looking forward to this one. Take it away, Uri. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for attending. Uh, so this talk is going to be about A-B testing and deep learning in the context of recommendation engines. So I'll start by introducing myself. I lead Argmax ML. Argmax is a software consultancy uh, doing only one thing, and hopefully doing it well. Uh, we develop uh, recommendation systems. So let's start with our agenda for today. The focus of today is going to be about experimentation because no recommendation algorithm exists in a void. We usually compare it to other um, methods and algorithms. And first, we're going to talk about use cases for experimentation. Then we're going to talk about A-B testing, which I guess that most of you are familiar with. And then we're going to talk about how we can extend A-B testing to other techniques that actually converge better and yield better results. The first one is multi-armed bandits. And the second is contextual bandits. Now, contextual band bandits can be implemented with machine learning and deep learning, uh, which is actually pretty useful in the context of recommendation engines. And then we'll uh, wrap up. Okay, so let's start with the, the bottom line. Uh, contextual bandits can actually shorten experiment time empirically uh, by more than 60%. And from our experiments, it can be even as short as 80%. So that's that can translate into a lot of savings. So a bit about our use, case, our use cases for today. We are going to talk about landing page personalization, about recommendation engines, which will be our main use case. And just to uh, open your mind to other use cases, we're going to talk about dynamic pricing uh, which is also a use cases a use case we attempted and was pretty successful. So let's start. I think that every company that tries to have any sort of campaign, this could be either an application or a service, usually starts by having by designing a landing page. Now most landing pages these days look something like that. We have a headline. We have a color, we have a call to action, we have some sort of art or a leader, we have creative. And actually, it matters a lot. For example, if I'm targeting um, people ages 20 to 40, I might use different creatives than, for example, uh, senior citizens. So we really want to match the creative and the target audience. Now, even with this simple landing page, we have so many parameters to control for. We can change the headline, we can change the colors, we can change the brightness, we can change the art. And if we try to tackle all of these combinations head on, uh, we will soon run into combina combinatory explosion, which is even more than exponent, exponential explosion, exposure, uh, which is actually put in simple words, a lot of variations. So a lot of variations means a lot of traffic and a lot of traffic means that we are going to wait for a long time until we have results that actually converge and mean something. Now this is only a simple landing page. Usually we also try to match the landing page with the funnel. Uh, for example, my landing page could be perfect. For example, I can offer a car for sale for $5,000. And this could be my headline. But if my Facebook ad um, said something like, hey, used car for sale for $1,000, there's some sort of a mismatch here. So 
we really want to control both the creative and the, the funnel itself and to have it like play together in sync. So from our perspective, as uh, the guys planning the experiment design, it means even more parameters to control for, which makes the combinatorial explosion even a harder problem to, to tackle. Uh, the second use case, which, which is actually our company's um, main focus, is recommendation systems. Now, recommendation systems can be formulated as a matching problem between a list of users, and users have features, right? They can be from a certain country, a certain age, they can have a certain purchase history, and so on and so on. And a list, a database, of products. Now, those products also have features. It could be like a certain category, sport category, or a productivity products. However, we do have a limited space, right? So we have like, a, in this example, we have like a 12 spots uh, to actually list the products that we think are uh, most relevant for that user. And choosing the products and ranking them is a recommendation system. Now, this is not much different than the landing page example that we had, except that uh, we are now specifically displaying products and not only headlines or texts. Now, developing a recommender system has a lot of considerations that are a bit more, um, um, that are a bit harder to identify. For example, let's say they developed a wonderful recommendation system for this user, let's call him Mickey. And these are the items that uh, Mickey sees on his first visit. Now, Mickey sees those items and purchases the Mickey doll. And then Mickey, a, a day passes and Mickey logs into our store the next day. In the meanwhile, we had some sort of process that retrains on our purchase history and identified that users like Mickey like uh, Mickey dolls. So we display more and more dolls of Mickey Mouse. Now, while this is helpful on the short term, on the longer term, we do lose a lot of potential because we miss potential, potential trends and other interests that uh, Mickey might be interested if he was exposed to. So for example, here, if uh, Mickey is uh, wants to diverse his shopping cart and actually buy something else, then it just wouldn't be listed over there. And I can just think like, for example, as a Netflix user, the amount of genres that I was exposed to just because of the of their recommendation engine, um, which is very different from what I used to watch. So this sort of exploration phase is very, very important in recommendation engines. So how do we, how do we solve that? How do we account for uh, future trends and we try to better the feedback loop? One strategy is just to randomize a few of the suggestions. For example, we can uh, show on items three to six random items. This tactic is called an exploration and the tactic of the strategy of showing the items that we think are most relevant is called exploitation. The trade-off, uh, this whole dilemma is called the trade-off between exploitation and exploration. And it's actually crucial because if we only exploit, then we're gonna fall into the feedback loop problem. And if we only explore, then we only show like random stuff and we don't learn anything. So we want something in the middle. So let's talk about some common exploitation tactics. For example, what are the most popular items on my store? Those are a classic exploitation problem. A item previously bought in my list basket. This is like pure exploitation. On the other hand, we have pure exploration, like showing random items, right? Or other items that are from similar to items that I, I previously looked at. Uh, or just items that uh, are recently added to the store in order to have uh, some some sort of uh, exposure to them. 
So those are exploration tactics, and we usually mix and match between exploration and exploitation strategies. Uh, for our last use case, which is kind of uh, interesting, especially in the advertising uh, tech and essentially any, any kind of machine learning model that uh, runs into auctions. So uh, behind the scenes, every time you log into an app or you actually see a news site, there's an auction. And all of the bidders in that auction try to price how much is the visitor, you and me, are worth to that bidder. And a bidder is essentially an agency that has a lot of advertisers. And the worth is actually depends, depends on the, um, the ads that that, that that bidder has. Now, since those bidders do not operate in a, in a vacuum, they need to know what is the, actually the common asking price. And a good way to, to try and implement a strategy for bidding is actually to explore and exploit using contextual bandits. Um, for those interested, uh, we will have another talk on real-time bidding and bandits. But for the moment, we can assume that instead of choosing like the color of the ad or the uh, creative, we can choose like, the the bid, the asking price, and explore and exploit on that. And our feedback is not a conversion, whether the user clicked or not. It is whether we won the auction or lost the auction. Okay. So we talked quite a lot about use, use cases for experimentation. Let's talk about A-B testing. A-B testing is the go-to strategy for most people starting to, to experiment. And for a good reason. It's pretty simple to implement, but there are a few, a few things you need to know in order to do A-B testing properly and get the right conclusions out of it. So how does A-B testing work? Uh, essentially, we split our traffic into two groups, the A variant and the B variant. One of them, usually the A variant, is being uh, allocated. We allocate a control group, which is, for example, uh, our current model or our current uh, website. And we have a test group in which we test like adding a new feature or deploying a new model or any any sort of thing that we think might have some sort of an of an effect and we let it run for a while we split the users into the a variant and the b variant a bucket b bucket and after a while uh, we measure what is the amount of clicks or dollar value or purchases that we got for each variant now, what could go wrong, right? It seems like a pretty pretty basic uh, setting. Well, it turns out that quite a lot. And let's try and highlight uh, a few of the use cases and a few of the pitfalls that we encountered. For example, one of them is splitting the data um, in a manner that, that is not random. For example, we had a client that had one server on the East Coast and another server on the West Coast. And because it was easier just to deploy one version of the software to one server and the other version to the other server, that's what that client actually did. But unfortunately, the user behavior in the East Coast and the West Coast uh, is different enough. And he introduced a new feature that causes the, the entire experiment to be irrelevant. Right, so we really need to be pretty mindful and think how we split the data in a way that doesn't introduce new features. Another example is called contamination. So let's assume that I have a user and I assigned him to bucket A, to variant A, and then the user just hits refresh or logs into the web into, uh, the day after, and then he sees a uh, variant B. So this problem is called contamination. And in order to solve it, we need to implement some sort of stickiness or to call out the user and to, to be persistent regarding the variance, the, the variant that we display to him or her. And one very common mistake, which actually it 
doesn't seem like something that's supposed to happen, but it's actually pretty common. So let's assume that we split the data evenly. So 50% of the traffic goes to variant A and 50% goes to variant B. And the, what we have to make sure is we need to verify that we also see the same ratio in the database. Because sometimes uh, there's some, some sort of process, for example, like an ad blocker or any other process that might cause the split to be different. So this, call, this problem is called a split ratio mismatch. It's actually very common and most people actually even don't try to verify it because it doesn't seem like something that, uh, that is supposed to happen, but it's actually pretty common. So uh, keep that in mind. And I think that the most common problem with A-B testing is that it takes a lot of time. And most people and managers are a bit impatient and sometimes you know you have to roll that feature until the end of the quarter and we still didn't achieve statistical significance so being impatient might be the number one cause for having results that are not significant and if your results are not significant it's essentially like flipping a coin so you really need to be careful regarding deriving any sort of conclusion for an experiment that didn't run for enough time. And that is like the number one problem with A-B testing. And there's an open question, how long should you wait? And there are two approaches. One of them is called uh, running some sort of significance test. Most of the significant tests, whether it's a Z-test, ANOVA, etc., um, output a value which is known as a p-value and p-value are very hard to interpret and i think it's the only concept in history that caused the american statistical association to have a press notice to be careful with p-values because they're super easy to interpret incorrectly so p-value are not probabilities exactly and you really need to be careful with them we personally prefer to run A-B tests within a Bayesian settings. Bayesian A-B testings are a bit uh, harder to set up, but they're a lot easier to interpret. And I found out that in most uh, meetings after the A-B testing, uh, the discussion is much clearer when you run an, a Bayesian A-B testing. Uh, we don't have p-values in Bayesian A-B testings. We actually have values probability values so we can act we can certainly we can say confidently things like there's a 10 percent probability that you will gain one million dollar more or less so um that's like a one one tip to make uh, the discussions after the a b testing more uh, informative and bayesian a b testing are actually one of the core um, methodologies that bandits multi arm bandits rely on so let's start to talk about bandits so a bit of a motivation uh, let's assume that i have five variants and i start with splitting the traffic evenly between them i see that that the black variant is actually more profitable than the other maybe i don't have to wait uh, for a month or for a long time until I change the traffic and get to the conclusion that the black variant is best. Maybe I can adjust the splits after an hour to have it get more of the traffic. So for example, after one hour, the black variant would get 40% of the traffic instead of 20. Right? And after two hours, it's gonna have 66%. So we can adapt the, the, the splits dynamically and thus saving potential uh, waste on other non-profitable variants. So this is essentially what uh, multi arm bandits try to achieve. And eventually, uh, they're going to get into convergence. And from our experiments, we can show that multi arm bandits usually get into convergence faster than classical A-B testing, which is a, which is a huge advantage. So a bit of annotation, a, a multi-arm bandit is 
a synonym for a slot machine. So usually when you talk about multi-on bandits, arms are experiments, like variants. A reward is like the amount of coins that you get once you pull the handle. So in our use case, it's, for example, the conversion rate or the amount of money that we got, the amount of revenue that we got from each variant. And the algorithms developing uh, for, um, for implementing multi bandits try to account for exploration, which is choosing a slot machine at random, and exploitation, which is choosing the best slot machine, the best variant uh, that we've seen so far. And most implementation relies on Bayesian statistics and Bayesian A-B testing. So this is how a multi arm bandit experiment looks like. We start with one variant, for example, with four variants. For example, uh, we can see here that uh, the light blue one gets most of the, most of the traffic as we as time passes, right? And um, from our experiments, uh, as mentioned before using multi on bandits can save a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, but it is worth mentioning that it is not a silver bullet. Uh, one of the use cases in which bandits actually do not perform well is if we have a delayed feedback. For example, if I'm trying to advertise a car or a mortgage, and most people actually convert after six months or something like that then because the, the feedback is so delayed, bandits cannot react fast enough, right? So typically, multi arm bandits and contextual bandits are best suited for cases in which the feedback is relatively short. And by short, I mean uh, hours or days, but not months. So uh, what about the context? Does it matter whether the user is from New York, New Jersey, California, or Spain. How does multi on bandit account for contexts? And we can think about contextual multi on bandits as a recommendation system, right? Because the context is the user features. Who is the user? Where is he from? What is, what is his uh, view, purchase history or viewing history? And the variants are actually the products that I'm trying to recommend, the products or items that I'm trying to display. And contextual bandits are very useful. This is essentially um, the architecture that Netflix relies on and a lot, of, a lot of other tech giants. And contextual bandits receive a lot of attention, both in, in the industry and in academic conferences. So let's talk about how to implement a contextual bandit. Uh, so there are essentially three strategies to account for context uh, with a multi on bandit settings. Uh, the first one is just duplicating the setting. This is not the official name, but we can think about it as multiple, multiple <laughs> bandits. So let's have a look. Let's assume that uh, I have users from California, ages 20 to 30, and users from New York, ages 20 to 40. Um, they have something in common, right? They're both the same age group. However, if we try to duplicate the entire setting, I will only count clicks and views on, the, on that exact same category without um, transferring any knowledge from one to another. And this setting is actually pretty easy to implement, and that's why it's uh, preferable by a lot of companies. But we obviously hurt our convergence rate, right? Because we do lose some information in the process. Um, the second adaptation is to have some sort of a simulated back. So let's assume that I know that users from New York and users from California at that age group are. 80% similar, then every time I see a click from New York, I can feed my California model 80% of a click. Now, this is a sort of a hack, and a lot of uh, companies uh, like that because it, it, it works, but 
if on the other hand I model the similarity between those two uh, categories in, a, in not, not in the right way then I can actually help my model and get to the wrong conclusions so you, re you really need to, to know how to model the similarity and the last and most classical way to implement contextual bandits is with a machine learning model so let's assume that my context is the user features for example where is the user from and what is his or her purchase history and other demographics uh, gender um, etc and the variants are essentially um, what I'm the products I'm trying to offer each variant would be a model and by a model it could be either a decision tree a logistic regression model or deep learning as long as the model outputs uh, some sort of probability then we choose the model that had the higher uh, the highest probability and we try to serve that um, the, the variant that correlates with that model to the user after a while we get the feedback right whether the user clicked on the ad or purchased the product and we retrain our model now it is worth mentioning that usually we don't just choose the model slash variant with the highest probability we usually try to sample or in other words randomize in proportion to the probabilities that the model outputs so in the long run we do it's it's a very neat way to balance both exploration and exploitation okay so what kinds of model of models can we actually implement in this uh, in this little box in this little robot, robot box so those models need to implement two functions the first one is to have some sort of incremental learning right in scikit learn notations it means to implement a partial fit function and also they need to be able to predict only not only the most likely uh, item but also the probability so we can uh, sample with proportion to that probability and that probability is hopefully calculated probability so the kind of model that we can use are mostly um, logistic regression deep learning uh, trees are a bit problematic with um, they require some an extra effort um, but actually deep learning is pretty it's pretty common with contextual bandits okay so there's a question uh, about how uh, should we use deep learning for contextual bandits so deep learning supports all of these requirements right so having an incremental learning is essentially having a few extra steps of a uh, stochastical gradient descent of SGD uh, which is a good thing but on the other hand predicting probabilities uh, with deep learning is not trivial um, in our use cases if the network that we are trying to optimize has a, a dropout in it then there's a technique for Bayesian um, A-B testing for Bayesian uh, approximation uh, by a work by Yerigal that uses a dropout as an estimate uh, which is pretty neat essentially you, you apply the dropout also in inference time and then you can have a, an estimate uh, of the probability so that's a, a, neat, a neat and easy way to have calibrated A-B testings calibrated uh, deep learning models in production uh, for those interested in the entire in the paper about uh, Bayesian approxima approximation um, I can refer you to, to the paper uh, we implemented implemented it uh, successfully in our use cases uh, it is literally three lines of code and it works pretty well okay so to summarize uh, we talked a lot about experimentation about a b testing contextual bandits multi bandits we had a lot of uh, things to cover and um, but to summarize all of these techniques help us personalize and to account for user features uh, when we try to recommend new items we also demonstrated that using uh, bandits and contextual bandits 
usually shortens the convergence time. And this time translates pretty literally to, to money, to money spent. And uh, multi-arm bandits and contextual bandits actually optimize for the balance, the right balance between exploration and exploitation. And we demonstrated that it, if we don't balance between exploration and exploitation, we can fall into problems like uh, feedback loops and other problems that occur when you run recommendation system uh, for a while. Thank you so much. And feel free to reach out if you have any other questions about the talk or about, uh, or about recommendation systems in general. Thank you.